From the outside, Eric and Corey Richen seem to be living the perfect little life. The attractive young couple had three young boys and were doing very well financially, living just outside of the very affluent Park City in Utah. They traveled, had a beautiful home, and spent a lot of family time with their boys. But beneath the exterior, something else was happening. Family members say Eric suspected his wife of trying to poison him, giving him food and drinks laced with poison. Eric got so suspicious that he changed his life insurance and his will to leave his money to his sister. Eric then died of fentanyl poisoning in March of 2022. At first, Corey played the role of grieving widow of a man who had overdosed on drugs. She even wrote a children's book about grieving. But as investigators continued looking at the case, they became convinced Corey murdered Eric and they now have charged Corey with murder claiming she laced his Moscow mule with fentanyl. Tonight we take a closer look at how prosecutors say Corey obtained the fentanyl as we investigate the death of the father of three, Eric Richens. I'm Betty Politan. Great to have you with us here tonight on Closing Arguments. And in many of the cases that we cover here and the trials that we cover here, linking the defendant to the murder weapon is crucial. Sometimes it's a gun and there's a shooting and there's ballistics and you take those ballistics and match it um, to a weapon that is owned by the suspect or owned by the defendant. Sometimes there's a knife or um, you know some other instrument that's used and maybe there's a fingerprint or maybe there's DNA that is left behind. Again, linking the defendant to the murder weapon. This case, a little bit different, but you still have to make that connection. Here we're talking about a Moscow mule that is laced, laced with fentanyl. So prosecutors have to somehow connect Corey Richens to the fentanyl that is used inside that Moscow mule to poison her husband. Now, we, we know where the defense is going to go here. They're going to say it's an overdose and he's taking drugs himself. So they've got a couple of hurdles here. One is connecting her to the, to the uh, actual uh, drug and then somehow connecting her to lacing something with that drug. And the Moscow mule, we believe, based on her own statements, that she fixed him a Moscow mule that night, that that's the way that she delivered uh, the fatal dose of fentanyl to her husband, Eric. Now, there's also allegations that this was not the first time that she had attempted to kill him. He also had a, a fentanyl sandwich. I think it was on Valentine's Day a sandwich that was laced, but obviously not strong enough to, to kill him. But it was enough that it made him sick. And again, making that connection, because if you have a case of poisoning, and this is pretty common in the poisoning cases we've covered through the years, is that the, the first attempt is not the, is not the successful attempt, and it's, not the, and it's not the last. So many times you can go back, how many other um, times did the defendant attempt to kill the victim or poison the victim? How did they do that? If you can connect them uh, to one or more, even if it's not the deadly dose, you, you can connect them to a prior um, instance where the defendant got sick from something that is connected to the defendant, it's, it's very persuasive in, inside of a courtroom. But now you're talking about, again, the linkage. So. Corey Richens is, she's a, a wife, she's a mother, she also has this real estate business, so where's her connection to the deadly drugs? Where did she get the drugs? This is a significant, and this is gonna be the way in this case that, that prosecutors make this connection. Because there's one of two things happening here. And, I'm, and each side is gonna argue opposite the other. Either she is going out to get the drugs that killed her husband, Eric, or Eric is somehow going out and figuring out a way to get the drugs because he's addicted, whatever, and takes the deadly dose himself. So making that connection is crucial for the prosecution here. 
because she has no drug addiction that we know about, no drug problem. So if she is out purchasing drugs, it's easier to put two and two together as to why she would do it. The defense, they don't have to prove anything, but do they have any evidence of him attempting to purchase drugs? So crucial witness for prosecutors here will be the cooperating witness that they have. The woman who said she purchased the drugs for Corey on two occasions. And that would be a, their cleaning woman. CL uh, is how she's been referred to in some of the, the papers, uh, the legal papers that have been filed. So someone who works for Corey Richens and works for the family cleaning the house is this alleged link to the fentanyl, which then is used to kill Eric Richens. So her testimony, her credibility is everything in this case for prosecutors. So during one of the preliminary hearings uh, inside the courtroom, we learned a little bit more about CL, uh, the cleaning woman who is the cooperating witness here from Detective uh, a Driscoll, who, who spoke about how this cleaning woman was getting the drugs and her connection and communications with Corey Richens. Let's take a listen. In our interviews, CL told us that in early 2022, the defendant reached out to her either by phone call or text message requesting that she procure fentanyl for what the defendant reported was a investor who had a back injury. Seal told us that she contacted acquaintance to after receiving his phone number and asked to arrange to meet to purchase some fentanyl from him. She stated that sometime in February, she believed uh, she met up with acquaintance to at a Maverick gas station in Draper and purchased from him 15 to 30 round green blue pills, which she understood to be fentanyl. What, if anything, did CL say about what she did with the fentanyl pills that she purchased from Acquaintance 2? CL told us that after purchasing the pills from Acquaintance 2, she returned home to her house in Heber. She said that either later that night or the next day, the defendant met her in the driveway of that home and did a hand-to-hand -hand exchange of pills for cash. CL told us that approximately a week after delivering the first load of fentanyl, the defendant reached out to her again by text or, or call and said that she wanted some more fentanyl that was stronger than the previous batch. CL told us that the second time that she procured fentanyl for the defendant, she did not have a vehicle to drive on that date. She said that she reached out to a friend, acquaintance three, and asked that he give her a ride to go purchase fentanyl. She said that he did pick her up, that they traveled from Heber City to the defendant's home in Francis, where, according to CL, the defendant had told her there was a check waiting under the mat at the defendant's home. She said that she checked under the mat and didn't find a check, and so she knocked on the defendant's door, and the defendant came to the door and wrote her a check from her business, from the defendant's business, for $1,300 for the purchase of the fentanyl. All right, $1,300 check. Should be able to present that in front of the jury. Um, sounds a little high for a cleaning bill, right? $1,300, that's a lot. So key witness, crucial witness, credibility is everything. Well, as often happens when you have a cooperating witness, why are they cooperating? Well, they're cooperating because they've got some other legal trouble, which is the case with the cleaning woman here, um, who actually has written a letter to the judge. Now, she's got uh, a separate a drug case that she's dealing with and writes a letter to the judge. We have this uh, via uh, DailyMail.com. Take a listen to this, to this letter. As you know, I've been 100% compliant with everything that's been asked of me, both by Summit and Wasatch Counties, I check in every time I've been asked. I've cooperated as much as I can with investigators and have cut people very close to me out of my life. You've asked me that I not have contact with either of my daughters. This means I can't see my grandchildren. It really scares me to testify against Corey Richens, and it gives me a lot of anxiety, but I'm going to do what's right 
I'm going to cooperate and fully show you that I'm going to do what's asked of me. If I am feeling like this, I'm afraid I might crumble on the stand. If I was able to be surrounded by those who support me throughout this process, it would really make this so much easier. Please reconsider the restrictions on my family and friends, or at least clearly tell me what has to be done so that I can see my family by the holidays. And this, she closes by saying, thank you. So is this a problem? It's always a problem when witnesses are writing letters because defense attorneys get their hands on it and they figure out a way to attack you based on the things that you're saying here. And in the case of someone who's got legal trouble and is a cooperating witness, they're always going to say, well, you're saying whatever you want to say to get yourself out of trouble. But what's going on here? She's talking about being uh, scared to testify against Corey Richens and talking about afraid she's going to crumble on the stand. Let's get to the bottom of it. Joining us tonight in Montgomery, Alabama, prosecutors and co-hosts of the Prosecutors Podcast, Alice LaCour and Brett Talley are with us, our friends, and in Salt Lake City, another one of our friends in Utah, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, and appointed spokesperson for the Richens family, uh, Greg Scordis is with us. Uh, great to see everyone. Greg, let me start with you. Um, what's going on with the cleaning woman here? It seems like she is so crucial to all of this. Is she crumbling? Is she falling apart? Well, I don't know, Vinny. I think that's a good question. I mean, she's surely uh, receiving a lot of pressure. There's a lot of uh, media attention to this case. Uh, I'm sure that she's being hounded by a lot of people. Her, unfortunately, her identity has been disclosed, even though she's supposedly a confidential informant. And uh, I, I'm sure that's very difficult for her. Whether or not seeing her children and her grandchildren will make her a better witness or at least more comfortable on the stand, uh, maybe she's uh, trying to sort of hedge her bets a little bit with the judge. Uh, she's also got her own problems. I mean, she was charged criminally with uh, some crimes, including uh, crimes related to drugs. So as you said earlier, I mean, she's she may be trying to, to work something that way. But she came forward early on, gave information which was corroborated by the state and gave information from which she wasn't receiving anything in return. And that was part of the reason, Vinny, that they filed these charges in the first place. Okay, Alice, I'll begin with you. You've got a crucial, crucial witness in your case, and she's writing letters to the judge. Um, I don't know. Is she trying to negotiate something through this letter? Uh, does it worry you as a prosecutor that you've got a witness like this and what could potentially happen on the stand? Absolutely. As a prosecutor, you're always going to be worried if your witness is saying things like, I might crumble on the stand. But one important thing to note in this letter is that it's conflating two issues. And it's not CL's fault because typically the lay person doesn't know where restrictions stem from. But in this case, a lot of the documents in CL's case is sealed, so we don't know all the details. But what we do know is that she has her own drug problems, drug legal problems that are separate and apart from the murder charges that have been filed against Richens. There have been no charges filed against her. And so her testimony shouldn't be linked to restrictions that honestly that she's described as part of your typical probation. It has to do with what she is in trouble for with her drugs. But it doesn't change the issue that in her mind, it's all one thing. She's feeling a lot of pressure. And in this situation, you want to make sure that she understands there are no promises made by the prosecution. She just needs to tell the truth. Yeah, my, my fear here, Brett, is that something happens. You know, something happens to this woman. And if something happens and, and she's unable to testify in this case, uh, what happens to the prosecution case? Can they still connect the defendant, Corey Richens, to the drugs that killed her husband? Well, I think it's going to be a lot more difficult. As you know, circumstantial evidence is great, but juries love to see an eyewitness. They love to see a cooperator who's going to lay it all out for them. That's the story they want to hear. And every, everybody who's ever prosecuted a case has had a witness like this. Somebody who is, you know, you don't get your best witnesses from the church choir, first of all. There's a reason Corey Richens can say, where would I get fentanyl? Because most people wouldn't know where to get it. Most of the people watching the show wouldn't know where to get it. So you need someone like CL. And I think the prosecution, they're going to have to work with her. 
and they're going to have to make sure that she's comfortable enough to get on the stand. Now, look, if it doesn't go great on the stand, that's fine. Sometimes that endears people to a jury. They look at that person, they say, look, this is not some smooth operator. This is somebody who never wanted to be in the situation and kind of got thrust into it. So can the prosecution survive without her? There's a lot of circumstantial evidence in this case. Do they want to proceed without the person who got the drugs? Absolutely not. So, uh, Greg, how is, the, how is the family doing right now? Because there were a lot of headlines surrounding all of this, that it's a potential problem in the prosecution of Corey Richens. Uh, how's the family holding up? I think they're still optimistic, Vinny, that the, the truth will come out. They're comfortable with the, uh, uh, the, the investigation that was done by the Summit County Sheriff's Office and the uh, Summit uh, County Attorney's Office. Park City Police, or excuse me, the, the Camas Police where the crime occurred. Um, they're, they're comfortable that the police have done a good job, that there was a thorough investigation. And this wasn't filed within weeks or, or, or even a few months after the homicide. It was almost a year. This was the culmination of a lot of investigation, a lot of work by a lot of police officers. And I think the family, I mean, they're obviously concerned because of the notoriety of these this case, Scott, which was a little bit um, unanticipated. Uh, we didn't expect it to go to this level, but they're, they have comfortable, uh, they have really comfort in the system and they feel like what, what, if the jury finally hears this, they believe that the jury will make the right decision. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that. Um, I, I've just seen defense attorneys who kind of, whatever you do, if, it, if you, solve a case quickly and charge someone quickly it's a rush to judgment and if you take your time it's like oh they couldn't figure it out right so they they i learned that as a young prosecutor no matter what i said the defense was going to make it sound like it's the wrong thing and that's just their job i guess um so um alice how do you sit down with this housekeeper prior to her testimony like how often would you speak with her and, and, and what would you do in preparation for perhaps one of the most important witnesses in the case who has some issues here uh, to get ready? I mean, you are going to prep this witness as much as you're able. There may be some limitations with her uh, mental frailty, with her ability to kind of you know, put up with all the hours it may take, but you want her to be as comfortable with you as the prosecutor as possible if you are taking her testimony, because you want her to feel comfortable with you. Even when there's 12 jurors watching, she feels like she's just telling you as a friend the truth. And that's what you want to be key on. She's important, but clearly that pressure is getting to her. So I, as a prosecutor, would want to show her all the other evidence, all the other circumstantial evidence we have text messages, checks, you know, prior circumstances of poisoning, show her that the case won't hinge on her. Even though I know she's my key witness, I wanna show her it's okay. Your job is just to tell the truth. We have other evidence as well. That's, I guess that's one of the easy things, right, as a prosecutor when you're prepping people. I mean, you just have to remind them, tell the truth. Because if you, you can't tell them to say anything else because you wouldn't, because that's not your job. Your job is to get the truth out. Um, so, Brett, as I, there's two ways I think the defense may attack the or, or come up with an explanation for these payments to the cleaning woman. One, it could be for cleaning, right? So and that's, that's one obvious one. But then there was also a mention uh, in, in the testimony we heard in that, in that preliminary hearing that when she originally got the drugs the first time, she was telling uh, the cleaning woman that they were for an investor who had a back problem. So... How do, you, how do you prepare for, or can you, do you try to anticipate what the other side's gonna, gonna say, or do you just uh, deal with it whenever they come out and, and come up with their explanation? Well, I think you try and anticipate it as much as you can. And look, there's an argument that $1,700 or however much it is is a lot to clean a house, but it's not a lot to provide the, the drugs that you need to kill somebody with. So I'm sure that's something the defense is gonna say. But I think what you do is you present to the jury that these are ridiculous excuses for this. And when combined with the other evidence, it's not just take the housekeeper's word for it. She's not the only witness. She got all this other evidence around her. And what's more believable, the story that she's telling you or that Corey is an intermediary for fentanyl for somebody's back pain. I mean, that's a, it must've been a pretty bad back if they're willing to take fentanyl, which as we all know, is a pretty deadly drug to try and deal with it. And then it just so happens her husband just so happened to die of a fentanyl overdose. 
not a strong story for the defense, in my opinion. All right. Our guests are going to stay with us. The prosecutors, Alice LaCour, Brett Taylor, and, of course, Greg Scordis. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about some allegations of alleged witness tampering by Corey Richens in this case. Plus, coming up next hour. In Birmingham, Alabama, the man suspected of murdering Natalie Holloway in Aruba back in 2005 has allegedly struck a deal with prosecutors in the United States to reveal how Natalie died and where her body is. Trones claimed to be a millionaire, but when his wife realized it was a lie, she ended up dead in her bathroom. You have fake cried over this woman's death. Now he stands trial for her brutal murder. The bathtub murder trial, weekday mornings on Court TV. Tell us where the kids are. This mother of two missing children just didn't seem to care. I mourn with all of you who mourn. Victim to verdict. All new Sunday night, 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. up with acquaintance to at a Maverick gas station in Draper and purchased from him 15 to 30 round green blue pills which she understood to be fentanyl. There was no fentanyl or traces of fentanyl found in the home anywhere. One or two pills might be accidental. 20 or five times the lethal dose is not accidental, Your Honor. That is a that, that is someone who, who wants Eric dead. Since Eric's death, we have learned and unfortunately are continually reminded that Corey is desperate, greedy, and extremely manipulative. We have watched as Corey has paraded around portraying herself living window, widow and victim, while trying to profit from the death of my brother. Desperate. I think that's a great word to describe Corey Richens based upon these next allegations. Like I said at the top of the show, it's crucial for prosecutors to connect her to the fentanyl. That's why the house cleaner is a, a crucial witness for the prosecution. But I think the defense is going to have their own version and story of how those drugs got there which is that Eric Richens had a drug problem is what they're going to allege. And he was getting them from somewhere. But in order to do that in court, you need evidence of it. So where is the evidence of all this going to come from? Take a look here. Um, there are some witness tampering allegations against Corey Richens that on September 14, 2023, Summit County Sheriff's deputies were searching her cell. And they found a six-page handwritten letter from Corey Richens to her mother, Lisa Darden, and it was found hidden inside of a book. And the letter, uh, allegedly, you'll get to hear it in a second, instructs her mom to get her brother to falsely testify. Oh, again, you need evidence, right? So they need their own way to somehow have this jury believe it's reasonable, reasonable to think that Eric Richens was the one who got the fentanyl that ended up killing him. So take a listen as, as, as we have the letter that was inside that book. We have parts of that letter that you will now hear. This is the so-called walk the dog letter. She wants to link Eric getting the drugs and pills from Mexico, so we need some kind of connection. Her private investigator is doing some research on the ranch cartel place Eric would stay at. Here's what I'm thinking, but you have to talk to Ronnie. He would probably have to testify to this, but it's super short, not a lot to it. He will need to talk to Skye at the meeting next week. Upon information and belief, just like they say, a year prior to Eric's death, Ronnie was over watching football one Sunday, and Eric and Ronnie were chatting about Eric's Mexico trips. Eric told Ronnie he gets pain pills and fentanyl from Mexico from the workers on the ranch. But not to tell me, because I would get mad, because I always said he just gets high every night and won't help take care of kids. Ronnie should have texts from Eric talking about getting high as well. Eric told Ronnie he keeps them in an allergy pill bottle in his work truck so I wouldn't find them. Ronnie never told me about the conversation. Eric finally told me and asked if Carmen could get him some. Eric never wanted anyone to know he had an issue, especially get caught. He always wanted Corey to go down for him. 
reword this however he needs to, to make the point just to include it all. The connection has to be made with Mexico and the drugs. Ronnie will have the messages to prove Eric confided in him about getting high. He can be short and to the point, but it has to be done. When you talk to Ronnie about this, meet up with him in person. I worry sometimes your house and phone are bugged. Tell him I need him to do this. Bring me home, and then we will get those damn bitches. We're so close to the end. Let's push through. Have the conversation with Ronnie before he meets with Skye. Then tell him to tell Skye at the meeting about the conversation. Hang in there. We're almost there. Love you to the moon. Now, Skye is her attorney, and it seems like she's attempting to do this and, and, and have her attorney receive the information from her brother, unbeknownst that she's the one setting it up. Wow, this is something else. Let's bring back in our guests, Allison Corp and, and Brett Talley, host of the Prosecutor's Podcast, and Greg Scordis, uh, representing the family of the victim in, in this case. Uh, uh, Greg, what are your thoughts about the walk the dog letter? Well, I think it speaks for itself, Benny. I mean, the uh, it, it's clear attempt to, at the very least, coach a witness, and probably worse than that, and that is uh, create evidence that's not true. But it seems to be, and, and she even says, you know, make this simple, make it short, but to the point, don't don't make it too complicated for poor Ronnie. Uh, this is a simple story. He's got to say A, B, C, and D. You know what you do, Vinny, when you're preparing for a trial is you say, hey, I need you to call my brother and tell him to tell the truth. Tell him to tell what, tell the prosecutor exactly what happened and tell the jury exactly what happened. But she's not doing that. She's saying, spoon feed him this information. Give it, make it really short so he doesn't complicate it too much and do it before he meets with my attorney and here's what he has to say. And then she outlines the, almost to the word what she wants this poor kid to say. And it, it's, it really is part of the defense that she's trying to create. Um, but it's not consistent at all with anything that anyone knows about Eric, which is that he was not a drug user, period. So, Brett, this letter, would you attempt to use it at her trial? I would use it as often as possible. It's an amazing piece of evidence. I've never seen anything like it. It's it's. You, rarely do you have a defendant who just says, here's exactly how I'm going to lie to try and get out of this. And the funny thing is, the best defense was, Eric, you know, got some drugs. You know how fentanyl is these days. It's in everything. But she can't even make that argument anymore because she has this letter, which she's now trying to say is some sort of fictional account. So if she then tries to turn around and say, well, it was fictional, but in reality, it's also true. There's no way that's going to work. Now, this letter is a bombshell piece of evidence. It's the kind of evidence that her attorney should be going to her and say, look, Plead guilty, throw yourself on the mercy of the court. Maybe you won't spend the rest of your life in prison. I mean, that's a basically the only option she has left. I think it's one reason you're gonna see some, some pretty extreme efforts, I think, by the defense to keep this letter out, either by claiming somehow this is attorney-client privilege or, or some impropriety by the prosecution in, in receiving it, because it is absolutely devastating. Okay, uh, look, Alice is just smiling ear to ear with this letter. Um, she does have, I think there's an explanation for this, and, and, and what I heard is, you know she's an author, right? She wrote the children's book about how to, how to deal with grief. Apparently this was part of another book she was working on, some sort of a novel. What do you think of that, Alice? I mean, sure, she can argue that, but if you're going to say it's a novel, it's certainly not attorney-client privilege. Attorney-client privilege has to be with your attorney for legal advice for legal proceedings. So here, I mean, the jury can listen to that you know, excuse that this is just a story she's writing. You know, it just happens that some key witnesses are named right here in the letter. It just happens that, you know, it's uh, naming her attorney by name. I mean, it seems like typically when you write something fictional, you're not going to have the exact words of real life there. So she can argue that all day long. The jury gets to weigh whether they believe her or not. And it's a really hard to believe story that these key witnesses named in here being coached about a likely defense is not just her attempt to, I'm going to say it, suborn perjury. So, uh, Greg, that attorney-client privilege issue, I think, will, will loom into, I think there have been allegations already, that this somehow was a letter that was supposed to go to her attorney. Um, but I don't know if her attorney wants this letter going to her, <laughs> right? So that's kind of a, a tough spot that she's in in all of this. I, I, I just, I think this is something the jury should hear. 
Oh, I think so too, Vinny. And it's not it's not a letter addressed to her attorney. Her attorney is, is mentioned in the letter in the third person. It's a letter addressed to her mother. So there's no attorney-client relationship there or privilege there. It does say, uh, talk to my attorney or do this, but it doesn't say my attorney has told me this or I need to talk to my attorney about that. I mean, it's not an attorney-client conversation. It's a letter to her mother attempting to uh, get a witness to testify falsely. And in that respect, it's probably admissible. And, and even if it's not admissible in the, in the government's case in chief, if Corey testifies and she testifies to anything that's not in that letter, it can be used to impeach her by the state. So even if by some miracle, the defense is able to get it suppressed, saying, well, they, they should have searched her cell, they, she had a right to some level of privacy, that letter's out there and she's bound by the, the contents of that if she ever says anything contrary to what's in that letter. Greg Scordis, great to see you tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Alice LaCour, Brett Talley, appreciate and great to see you. Uh, the Prosecutors is the name of the award-winning podcast. And we'll see you again really, really soon. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk more about this case. And, and as I mentioned, there was more than one attempt here, according to prosecutors. There's the Moscow Mule... But there was also the Valentine's Day sandwich. We'll talk about that next. There's a tragic outcome in this case. Civil trial that is the focus of the Netflix documentary, Take Care of Maya. How a misdiagnosis tore their family apart. They continue to accuse Jack and Beata of being child abusers. Jack called me said Beata just hung herself. Is the hospital they're suing responsible for what happened? The Take Care of Maya trial. Trial coverage weekday mornings at 8, 7 central on Court TV. Do you want to relive the biggest moments from our captivating trials? Stay up to date on all the breaking legal and true crime news? Well, Court TV's Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube channel have exactly what you're looking for. So come join the conversation with us at Court TV. We are your front row seat to justice. She said that they got in bed between 9.30 and 9.45 and that shortly after getting into bed, one of the children had a nightmare, and that the defendant got out of bed and went to be with that child in their bedroom and slept in that bedroom until 3 a.m. or around 3 a.m. when she woke. She stated she returned to her own bedroom, got into bed, and felt that Eric was cold to the touch. She stated that she turned the light on, saw that he wasn't breathing and that he didn't look normal, and that she then called 911. Investigators found text messages between the defendant and her best friend that uh, was her explanation to her friend that she conducted CPR on Eric prior to EMS arrival. And do those text messages read, I pumped so damn hard, so hard, screaming at him to come back to life? Yes. So the night of the death of Eric Richens. Is it an overdose, self-induced overdose, or was he murdered by his wife, Corey Richens? That's the question. Uh, take a look at this from one of the prosecution filings. On March 3rd, 2022, the defendant stated that she made Eric Richens a Moscow mule in the kitchen and brought it to their bedroom where Eric consumed it while sitting in bed. The defendant stated she went to bed and shortly after went to sleep with one of the children in the child's bedroom. Defendant stated she woke up around 300 hours, uh, oh, 300, and came back to her in Eric's bedroom. She said she felt Eric Richens and he was cold to the touch. Why don't you take a look at another filing here? February 14th, Valentine's Day, 2022. The defendant prepared a sandwich for Eric Richens and placed it on the seat of his truck with a love note. Shortly after consuming the sandwich, Eric Richens broke out in hives and had difficulty breathing. Eric found his son's EpiPen and administered it to himself and slept. Eric Richens believed that he had been poisoned. Eric Richens told a friend he thought his wife was trying to poison him. Let's bring in our guest. Joining me in Jacksonville, Alabama, forensic death investigator, professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University and host of the very popular Body Bags podcast, Joseph Scott Morgan, and in Barrington, Rhode Island, board-certified forensic pathologist, Dr. Priya Banerjee. Great to have you both here. 
Joseph Scott Morgan, um, how do you, how can you can you scientifically determine any of this stuff? Like to the, the poisoning, what was in the Moscow mule, how the fentanyl is absorbed in the body, how it, how it ended up, however he took it. Uh, is any of that going to be able to be scientifically proven inside of a courtroom? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, fentanyl is uh, essentially part of a standard tox panel now. You know, at, at autopsy, when blood is drawn and urine is taken, and all those things that, that is done at post, those samples are taken in and they'll run that panel. And if fentanyl pops up, it's not something that you would normally associate with day-to-day -day living now, is it? But let me ask you this, uh, let me ask you this. Yeah. Would you be able to tell if the thing was like, if the pills were crushed up and put in a drink and mixed up, or if someone is just taking the pills themselves as whole? Uh, yeah, uh, certainly uh, at autopsy, you know, gastric contents are examined. And if if a thorough scene investigation is done by, say, for instance, the ME investigator that's out there or the police, you can look for any kind of residue that might be uh, might be in in the container. However, please keep in mind, Vin, that fentanyl is so very lethal. It's a hundred times more lethal than heroin. You can microdose on this stuff, and it doesn't take much to push an individual over. So, the residue that we might look for in other cases might not be as prevalent in fentanyl. It doesn't take much to, uh, uh, to cause a fatal event. Dr. Priya Banerjee, let me ask you about the, the second incident, which actually happened first that I described, which was this sandwich. Does the, the, the symptoms and what happened there, does that, does that strike you as, as, a, as a, a fentanyl poisoning that perhaps wasn't deadly? Does, is it consistent with that? I actually think that I don't know what his medical history was in terms of allergies, but hives, I think, as an allergic reaction. So I don't know if he put something in there to stir up a lethal allergy. Um, fentanyl usually doesn't give you hives. It's more of like slows down your breathing and, and that's how you overdose. Um, and so the mechanism doesn't sound quite right for that. Maybe she tried different methods. I, I don't know. You know, um, again, It'll be interesting to see. Now, unfortunately, the prior event is no longer in his system to test. Does that make sense? We're only catching with toxicology what's in his body at the time of death. So we're only catching this event. And how precise um, can you be with the time of death in a case like this? And I'll begin with you, Dr. Banerjee. You know, I think you use multiple pieces of data you know, there's post-mortem changes he's found inside. He's an average size guy. So I think you can um, start estimating from that. You look at the last activity in his cell phone, what the history is, um, and you can get an estimate. You know, it's not to the minute, not to the hour even, but it sounds like when he's discovered later, he, we would see those post-mortem changes already. Joseph Scott Morgan, take a look at her story cold to the touch how long after death um is someone cold to the touch uh well a lot of it is environmentally dependent upon what uh you know the ambient environmental temperature is here's here's the key you know to say that someone is cold to the touch is very non-specific so in in our world that we inhabit in the medical legal world we'd like to do things like core body temperature you know and we can measure a rate and as the doctor mentioned we're contrary to what you see on television we can't narrow this down to minutes we can bracket it with hours essentially but just to kind of frame it out you know after death someone will become cold to the touch appreciably probably within about three to four hours uh, by the time you get out to the 12th hour after death, all of that energy that you've generated in your body that is demonstrated through, you know, the warmth touch, the warm touch that you might have to someone's body, you know, where you can, add, it's, it's tactile, that's dissipated after about 12 hours. Uh, and somebody, you know, I'm not trying to be rude here, but you, you do in fact reach room temperature. That's kind of a metaphorical statement that many people make, but that it is true. Um, and so after that amount of time, 
you know, you would, in fact, be very cool to the touch. One other thing that we'd look at, though, Ben, is the degree to which rigidity is in the body. And also my favorite favorite thing is the settling of blood post-mortem because it's only impacted by, by gravity. So is, it, is, the, is the settling of blood, the post-mortem lividity, still blanchable? The question is not what did the wife say or see at that or sense. It's what did the medical legal authorities at the scene what was their assessment? That's what I want to know. What did they find out? And I think we might find out out at trial. And finally, before, before we run out of time, less than a minute here, Dr. Banerjee, um, self-induced overdose versus a poisoning. Um, is there anything you're looking for, either autopsy or from investigators at the scene to try to uh, figure that out? Yeah, I mean, I always say we don't practice in a black box. And so you want to think about, okay, now I'm getting a snapshot of what toxicology is in his body is a high level of fentanyl. Now, if he has no, like, suicidal history, no history of drug abuse, then, and obviously there's other um, investigative issues that you discuss separate from the medical issues that now set a, a scene for more of a suspicious death rather than a self-induced like suicidal death so that's where it comes so when we're looking at the toxicology i can't tell you how it got there but when we look at the rest of the story that's when you have to put the pieces together and actually you know i've had i've gone to crime scenes where the liquid in the glass if there's anything residual can be tested or even the glass residue itself and you know that gives you a great idea of the route of administration which means how did it get in him Right, so even those proofs are very important. Big thank you, Dr. Priya Banerjee, Joseph Scott Morgan. Thank you for your time. I know it's valuable. We'll see you again really soon.